Well, good evening. You can, you can shout back at me. Good evening. Good evening. Thank you for your attendance here in Bible study at First Baptist Church, Sulphur Springs, uh, the place I refer to as the greatest church on the planet. And I mean that when I say that, uh, partially uh, because uh, half of that equation is very easy. Uh, we serve a great God. Um, and as long as we're leaning on him, uh, everything else works out. Uh, he takes our weakness and provides strength. In fact, uh, the word tells us that it's in our weakness that his power is made perfect. Uh, so while I do love this church, um, I, I think any church is great when they lean upon the great God that we call upon. Um, as we enter into Bible study this evening, if you would join me in a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do confess um, your greatness. Um, and we also confess your, your goodness to each one of us. And that while you created everything, and, and you keep this earth spinning, and you, you hold all all things together. And at that same time, you, you still love us. You, you still love the, the very people in this room. And you provide for our needs. And in fact, your word tells us that you meet all of our needs according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. May we be people that know that truth. May we lean upon it. May it provide us peace and comfort and hope. And may it drive us to speak of your goodness and your greatness to those around us. Father, we pray that as we open up your word this evening, that your spirit would lead us to truth that we would have the eyes to see, the ears to hear what you have for us this evening. And Father, it, it is our prayer that this wouldn't be a pursuit of mere knowledge, but that the reading of your word, the study of your word tonight would, would draw us closer to you. And it would renew our minds, that it would transform our lives. We pray these things. So thankful that you hear us. And we pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, we're going to spend this semester on, on Wednesday nights um, in a slow walk through the book of Colossians. Um, I encourage you now, go ahead and find your way to the book of Colossians. Um, dial your phone up to the book of Colossians. Uh, we will provide a, a brief introduction to the book tonight and, and look at a few verses. But I want to begin by telling you a bit of my own story with the book of Colossians. I, I have uh, never been ashamed to tell folks that, that it's a personal favorite of mine, and it, it became a favorite very early on in the, my life of faith. I, I can't remember the reason why, uh, but when I first started to read the Bible, I started with the book of Colossians. And uh, I had a mentor in my life at that time when I first came to faith, and uh, we decided that we were going to read the Bible, and, and we were going to read it um, with serious devotion, and, and we were going to read it slow. And we, we started with the book of Colossians, and I would read a chapter from Colossians. Of course, you start at chapter 1, and I would read Colossians 1 every morning, and I would read it one day, and, and then the next, and then the next, and... Uh, my mentor and I, we, we would meet on a regular basis, and when we felt it was time to move on, we moved on to Colossians chapter 2. 
Um, and in those early days of faith, um, it is as if God really wrote the book of Colossians onto my heart. He, he pressed it into my heart. Um, a few years after that, when, when I felt uh, the call uh, to seminary and the call to, to serve the church, um, the very first time that I was given a month of Sundays uh, to preach, you know, what in the world do I preach? <laughs> um, well, I know Colossians 1, 2, 3, and 4 very well. So my first four sermons, uh, when I got a month to preach, was four sermons covering the four chapters of Colossians. A few years after that, I, I'm pastoring a church and um, started a Wednesday night Bible study with, with a group of men. And it was a really small group. After a while, that, that group transformed a little bit and a really small group got to a little bit bigger of a group, and these guys were really wanting to take a slow walk through the book of a Bible, and we started with the book of Colossians, and then of course at that church I also preached through the book. It was years after that um, that our church was taking routine mission trips uh, to the country of Romania, and after a couple of those trips, I was invited back to do a, a week-long pastor's training with a number of pastors around a certain region in Romania, um, and I taught them the book of Colossians, um, and, and here, uh, I'm going to teach it once again, and I have to admit, there's a, there's a bit of a a selfish motive there, uh, that, that it's something that I want to teach. Uh, it, it's something that I, I feel capable and, and equipped to teach. I'll tell you folks, um, as one with the task of preaching and teaching, I, I preach on a Wednesday night and I preach on Sunday mornings and, and Sunday evenings. Um, and often, I'm like, I just wish I could have had another two weeks with that sermon. Um, I don't feel like I got it where I wanted it to be yet, but it's Sunday morning and somebody's got to preach, right? So I have to take the sermon uh, that God has given me at that point and carry it up into the pulpit. Um, there's a part of me, while it's selfish, there, there's a part of me that I feel uh, that God has really worked the book of Colossians into my heart, um, that he has thoroughly equipped me um, to teach it. So I think while it's selfish for me, I think it's beneficial for you uh, to, to hear something uh, that I have wrestled with and worked with uh, for a long time and, and in many different settings. Uh, so, so it is with great joy um, that I, I share it with you. And I have it mapped out, and, and I kid you not, it's, it's going to be a bit slow um, at some point. Um, there may be some screams from the back. Oh, we could go a little faster than this, and I would be okay with that because the, the beginning of Colossians does set the groundwork um, for the rest of the book. Before we read it, I, I do want to cover um, a few introductory matters. Um, the book of Colossians, um, like many books uh, in our New Testament, uh, begins with an address of who wrote the book. We, we get a reference to the Apostle Paul, and we get a co-sender, Timothy. So when you're looking at the book, the very beginning, a few introductory matters, uh, Apostle Paul, who we probably know fairly well, and a co-sender, Timothy, who... We recognize the name, but we probably know to a lesser degree. Uh, you read the book of Colossians, you'll get a couple of references to the fact that Paul writes this letter through suffering. He'll end the letter with a reference to his chains. So if we're picturing, we're, we're starting the study of this book. We can picture the apostle Paul. Timothy's probably not with him. But he lists him as a co-sender. And the Apostle Paul is in chains. 
scholars will debate the, the when and where. Uh, if you're interested, I personally think this was during Paul's imprisonment in Rome, somewhere around 60, 61 AD. So we can picture Paul in chains writing a letter, but for what reason? If you read the book of Colossians, as we will, uh, you get into chapter 2, and it seems as if in Colossae, there is some sort of error, some sort of teaching that has missed the mark. People refer to it as the, the Colossian philosophy or the, the Colossian heresy. In chapter 2, Paul seems to be ex addressing something specific. Perhaps it's this false teaching, this error that has led him to write the entire letter. Well, what's in it? Uh, chapters 1 and 2 really lift up who Jesus is. Uh, I'll, I'll call this whole study the, the supremacy of Christ. That really is chapter 1 and chapter 2. Who is Jesus? Why is he important? What, what has he done? Uh, how does he relate to God? Chapters 1 and 2, the supremacy of Christ. You can look at chapters 3 and 4 and really see submission to Christ. While 1 and 2 are highly theological, chapters 3 and 4 are highly practical. Because Jesus is this, from 1 and 2, we now must live like this. Chapters 3 and 4. Supremacy to Christ, submission to Christ. You still with me? Can I hear a big, loud amen? Amen. 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 So a little bit more. And again, we're, we're going to move slow, so just get used to it, right? But I'll, I'll try to, to speed up these introductory matters a bit. But Colossae, um, modern-day Turkey. Put that in your brain. We're, we're studying the book of Colossians Paul, probably in prison in Rome, writing to a small farming town in modern-day Turkey. It's located 120 miles east of Ephesus, who also receives a New Testament letter. It's right in the Lycus River Valley of what was then known as Phygeria. The city was also 11 miles southeast of Laodicea, a church that also receives a letter that we find in Revelation chapter 3. If you look up ancient Colossae, you don't find much. It was a small farming community overshadowed by Laodicea and another city, Heropolis, about 15 miles northwest. We can look at historical records and see that in that region, somewhere around 60, uh, the region was hit by an earthquake. Laodicea, Heropolis, cities with money and businesses rebuild. It's probably likely that Colossae never did. Other cities get to add to their historical record, and Colossae doesn't. So what was the city like? Uh, we see chapter 2, there's some reference to a, to a heresy, some sort of philosophy that's in error, in contradiction with what we would know about uh, Jesus. And Paul's writing to correct that. Well, what was the spiritual climate of the city? Um, it's in the Roman Empire, first century um, we could make a lot of assumptions. Roman Empire, any city you went into would be okay with religious plurality. You know, worship whatever you want. You, you can worship this and, and you can worship that. And you, you can mix those two things together, right? You can treat it as a buffet. That's just fine. Just take some of this and, and some of that. And, and we see that in the little bit of the historical record that we have. We see the religious plurality. Uh, we can look at ancient tax documents, and there seemed to be some sort of substantial Jewish population. Uh, but we can look at ancient coins from Colossae, and we, we can see on these ancient coins the Ephesian god Artemis, the, the Laodicean god Zeus, their own local moon god Men, the, the lunar goddess Selene, the Egyptian deities of Isis and, 
and Serapis, along with a whole host of other Greek deities. And we can read some other religious documents of the time and see that there seemed to be some high-level belief in spirits and powers and angel worship. And we can even see some documents that refer to some extreme forms of behavior related to those worship practices. Now, I mentioned that all because we'll read the book of Colossians and see Christ exalted high. You'll see references, specifically in in chapter 1, beginning at verse 15, references that Jesus is supreme over all things. That it's Jesus who created all things. It's Jesus who who rules over all things. And when you read Colossians chapter 1, you'll see long lists. The the Apostle Paul's not okay with just saying all things. He'll say all things, and by that I mean this, and this, and this, and this, and this, and this. In a place, in a region, that was okay worshiping anything and everything. The Apostle Paul writes, no, Christ is supreme over it all. So, how how does this small farming town have a church? You ever think about that when you read these New Testament letters? How did the story, how did the message of this supreme Christ Come to this small town. Well, you read the book of Acts. Um, You you go and you look at Acts 19 and, and you see the Apostle Paul come to the city of Ephesus. It tells us, you you read Acts 19, he comes to the town and he develops a habit of going into the synagogue and arguing debating, preaching about the kingdom of God. Tells us this. This becomes his practice. He goes into the synagogue and he he preaches Jesus. He, He argues about what it means to be a part of the coming kingdom. Acts 19.10 tells us this little line. This is a quote from Acts 19.10. That this went on for two years so that all the Jews... And Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. So just put that in your brain for a moment. Paul goes to Ephesus, which is nearby Colossae, and he preaches for two years to where Luke and Acts summarizes it. He did this so much, he did it so well that everybody in the whole region knew what Paul was preaching. Then you open up the book of Colossians and you find that it it doesn't appear that the Apostle Paul founded this church. Hopefully you've got Colossians open. Verse 7, after the Apostle Paul has been discussing the things of Jesus and faith and love and, and hope, In verse 7, Paul says, you learned it from Epaphras, our dear fellow servant, who was a faithful minister of Christ on our behalf. And, in verse 8, who also told us of your love in the Spirit. Look at verse 9. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, We have not stopped praying for you. So, trying to piece this together, these references in Colossians chapter 1 and Paul preaching in Acts 19, we we come up with the idea that perhaps while the Apostle Paul's preaching in Ephesus, that Epaphras makes his way from Colossae 
hears the preaching of the Apostle Paul and then goes back home and preaches the gospel. And then a church is born. Through the preaching of the Apostle Paul, though it appears he was never there. He didn't found it. He didn't preach it. He didn't build the church. He's writing this letter because he's heard about their faith. Think about that. I, I, I would love for you to meditate on that a little bit as we, we get into the book of Colossians. Here's yet another example of something that just makes the preacher's heart happy. We know the name Paul. If we hadn't just read Epaphras, if I stood up here and asked you who was Epaphras, there would probably be a lot of us that would go, oh, I don't know. <laughs> but he's the one that heard Paul's preaching, took it back to his hometown, took it back to his neighbors and preached Jesus, And it's because of Epaphras' hearing of the gospel and believing of the gospel and preaching of the gospel that a church is born. And because of his faithful work, we get the letter of Colossians. A name we probably wouldn't even recognize. I think that, that should spark something in all of us. There are countless people I mean, in, in pews in this church and in pews in churches all across the world. We may not be able to recognize their name, but when we're faithful to what we've been called to do, who knows what God can do with faithful work? So here's how the gospel comes to town for the church in Colossae. And another interesting note as we look at this, the, the gospel comes to town through what we would think is Epaphras hearing the gospel and taking it back to his home. We now get this letter from the Apostle Paul to this church. But an, another interesting note, this is going to be really easy if you've got a paper copy of the Bible in front of you. Um, but let's look at Ephesians, or excuse me, Colossians 4, uh, verse 16. Not only is this a letter to the church in Colossae, but the Apostle Paul attends for this letter to have a bigger effect. Verse 16. After this letter has been read to you, See that it is also read in the church of the Laodiceans, and that you, in turn, read the letter from Laodicea. Here you have a circular letter. It's been carried from Paul in prison. So think about this. This is one of those things I just love to get into my brain. You've, you've got... Paul in Rome, in chains, writing a letter to Colossae. And once they hear it in their church gathering, he wants it read in the church gathering in Laodicea. And then they want letters swapped. It's the spread of the gospel. It can happen from a man hearing the preaching and taking it back to his home. It can, it can happen from the Apostle Paul writing letters while under arrest. Uh, I wonder how many other ways the gospel can spread from this group gathered here. Where will this group here take the gospel? Hey Amen. Are you still with me? Amen. I want to look at a few more themes and then we can jump into the letter. When we're looking at big themes of Colossians, the, the first is Christology. That's a, a fancy word that means the study of Christ, uh, the study of Jesus. As I said earlier, these first two chapters will be soaked with who Jesus is. If you have your copy of it open, first 
15, Colossians 1, 15, begins with this beautiful note. Listen to what it says about Jesus. We'll dig deeper into this when we get there. The Son, this is Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. The firstborn over all creation. Glancing at my clock. It's hard for me to read that and not talk about it. So I'm going to talk about it for just a second. It happens to be my favorite verse uh, in the Bible. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. Think about this. If we have questions about God, we find the answers in Jesus. If we go, hmm, I, I wonder how God would want us to live. We find those answers in Jesus. I wonder what are the things that God actually cares about. We find the answers in Jesus. Right? And then if we have it written, we even bring it down to a personal level. I, I wonder if God loves me. We read the pages of the Gospels and, and we see how Jesus loved everybody. How he ate in the houses of people that nobody else would enter. And he met people by the well that nobody else would meet. And he gave sight to the blind and he healed the lepers. A lot of questions that we may ask about God, that we may ask about how God relates to us. Apart from Jesus, those are fuzzy. We don't know the answers. We guess. We think, but in Jesus, the invisible becomes visible. This is the beauty uh, of the Christmas story. It's an aspect of the Christmas story that we don't preach enough. One day, God showed up, <laughs> left heaven, and took on flesh, and was there in the neighborhood. Invisible became visible. Here's a theme. We'll keep it going. In verse 16, for in him, in Jesus, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. We could read all of the remainder of the chapter, this imagery, this deep study of who Jesus is is a theme of Colossians, very, very closely related to that. You'll, you'll see the theme of a, of a mystery. You'll see that word sprinkled throughout Colossians a number of times. Well, well, Apostle Paul is praying that they come to a full knowledge, that they have a complete understanding. Uh, there's some who are confused. Uh, to, to some, the things of God are a mystery that, that Jesus is going to make known, make visible. You say Christology, you, you, say, you see this theme of a mystery being brought to light. You also see the theme of the body over and over again in the book of Colossians. We don't have time to look at all these. You, you do see this references to the collective group of believers in Jesus Christ as the body. And that's a thing I think in this day and age, especially in light of what the church has experienced the last five or six months. It is typical when we're in church gatherings. Um, and I'm guilty as charged. We, we want to make faith personal as it should be. Uh, but sometimes we speak of it on the personal level to the neglect of the corporate level. Uh, there's great value in the body. 
of believers. The church, though made up is of individuals, does need to come together as Christ designed it. You see the body of Christ. You also see a, a theme of suffering uh, numerous times uh, in the book of Colossians. Paul will reference his suffering for the sake of the gospel. It, he ends the letter on, on a plea. Remember my chains. The gospel is spreading uh, but it doesn't spread at ease. The gospel spreads, but it comes at great cost. Amen? All right, let's jump into this. Tonight, we're going to look at a whopping two verses. Um, because, again, it, it helps us here. Let's read the first two verses, and then we'll break it down a bit. I promise moving forward, we'll cover more ground, but we'll still move slow. Um, Colossians 1 and 2. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus, by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother. Verse 2. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers, or, or you may have the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ, grace and peace to you from God our Father. And I know if you're at home reading these verses uh, at your kitchen table or in your living room in your favorite lazy boy recliner, those are two verses that you could easily speed past. Probably because you've heard them a lot. That, that sounds like familiar language. But let's think about this for a moment. If you're, you're picturing Apostle Paul in prison, in chains, writing a letter. He's writing it to the small farm town in Colossae. A, a town with all sorts of religious atmosphere and plurality. Uh, the, these words would have great meaning Apostle Paul is using the standard greeting for first century letters, yet he's giving them a Christian makeover. This general, generally sounds like how the, you would start an ancient Near East first century letter, but it's infused with meaningful, theologically rich words. Here's Paul, an apostle. We see that as a title. It's familiar to us. You'll, you'll look at other New Testament letters, and uh, specifically Romans eleven thirteen, Galatians two eight. Paul will add to that. He's an apostle to the Gentiles. Apostle. It's a, a word that means a messenger, an envoy, a, a delegate, one commissioned by another person. Literally, it means a sent one. If you just robbed it of all of its meaning and you just translated the word into English, sent one. He's Paul, a sent one, one who has been commissioned by another person. Well, who is that other person? He's of Christ Jesus. Paul, he, one who has been sent, one, one who has been called out and sent out by Jesus. Again, if you can expand your mind a bit beyond this specific letter and you can remember Paul's story, one, one who, who had all of the religious resume of a faithful Jew, so much so when, when he hears of the news of, of these Groups that are gathering together, meeting in homes, and worshiping this Jesus who they say was crucified and then rose from the dead. Paul was so faithful to God, so, so bound, so, so obligated, so zealous by his devotion to God that he was going to stamp out, stomp out, get rid of these 
Jesus worshipers. Till this day that he's, he's on the road to Damascus and the risen Jesus shows up. Paul's blinded and knocked off his horse and he's given a new job description. His life has changed. And he's now going to be the one that takes the message of this risen Jesus to the Gentiles, to the world. He begins this letter, again, with language we know well. But think about Paul writing these words. Think of Paul, a sent one. <laughs> sent by that, by that one, that, that, that risen one that knocked me off that horse that day. Acts chapter 9, on the road to Damascus. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus. And then I love this line, by the will of of God. <laughs> this was not Paul's idea. He had charted his life. He, he was moving full steam ahead with what he thought was right. And then his life got changed. He's a sent one. Sent one by Jesus Christ, but it's not his idea. It has no human origin. This is of the will of God. That's an easy place for a question this evening. What can you say that you do by the will of God? Where is Jesus sending you? What can you look at in, in your own life and say, I, I don't do this because I want to. I, I don't do this out of human origin. I, I do this by the will of God. And then we get reference to the co-sender. He says, and Timothy, our brother... Timothy is a, a frequent, frequent co-sender of New Testament letters. He's listed as a co-sender on 2 Corinthians and Philipp, Philippians and Philemon. He also appears as a co-author with Paul and Silas in 1 and 2 Thessalonians. When you read the book of Acts, you can see Timothy as a travel partner. You see him appear um, with Paul in Acts 16, Acts 17, Acts 18, and Acts 19. You can read this line from 1 Timothy 1-2. That's a letter from Paul to Timothy. Uh, in 1 Timothy 1-2, uh, Paul says, To Timothy, my true son in the faith. It has led many to believe that it's Paul who brought Timothy to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. Paul, apostle of Jesus by the will of God and his son in the faith, Timothy. Pinning this message. And then in verse 2, we get the audience to God's holy people in Colossae. The faithful brothers or brothers and sisters in Christ. We get a reference to the church in Colossae as God's holy people. If you've been hanging out here for some time, you'll, you'll hear me reference to, to the group right in front of me is, is the holy people of Sulphur Springs. I, I started that when we were preaching through Philippians. You, you see that same address here in Colossians. Paul can look at the church and call them holy people. 
It's a very interesting word, depending dependent on, on how it's used. Um, the word can easily be trained, translated as holy people, or, or you could say saints. We in the Baptist tradition are a little fearful of calling people saints, but either one is, a, is an adequate translation of the word there. Holy people or saints. Again, this is why I wanted to go slow. We, we might breeze past that without giving it any thought. Uh, we might breeze past that thinking it's not significant that perhaps Paul's just giving flowery language. He's buttering up his audience a bit. But no, this is deeply theological. And, and something we need to be reminded of over and over again. Paul, and again, he, he doesn't address this here, but you'll see this through the entirety of the letter. He's not calling this church holy people because they live perfect lives. He's not calling them holy people. He's not calling them saints because they have achieved or attained perfection. They are holy people, not through anything they've done. But they've been made holy by the atoning work of Jesus Christ. And you know this story well, but we need to be reminded of it again. I'd love if you, you take slow reads of the New Testament letters. You'll hear Paul say, I've told you this before. I remind you of this again because we need to hear these things. We are made holy. We, we can enter the presence of God because of the atoning work of Jesus. He's the one who has died upon the cross. He's, he's the one that rose from the dead. And in our baptism, we unite with Jesus in his death and in his resurrection. That allows us to enter the presence of a holy God. That makes us holy people, not because of what we've done, but because of the forgiveness, the eternal life that Jesus has provided to us. His righteousness bestowed to us. Why does that matter? Well, it matters because despite your best intentions, you, you showed up to church on a Wednesday night. And you're, you're opening, up, opening up the word of God because you want to be faithful. You, you want to live the lives that God has called you to live but tomorrow, <laughs> things will happen. <laughs> There'll be thoughts that sneak into your brain. There'll be words that slip out of your mouth. There'll be things that you don't want to do that you'll do. There'll be things that you know you should do that you don't do. And if we think that our holiness is based upon our work, our thoughts, our speech. When we mess up tomorrow, we'll say, I I've messed it up. I I've slipped away. This is a theological truth that the Apostle Paul can look at a group of sinners and call them holy people because they've united with Jesus. Because of Jesus' righteousness has been bestowed upon the church. Holy people in Colossae. And he goes on to describe that. He goes on to call them faithful Brothers, faithful brothers and sisters. You'll probably notice, I, I read from the updated NIV that was updated in 2011. You'll, you'll, you'll often see the, the, the updated NIV reference brothers and sisters. Uh, they haven't just made that up. When, when Paul speaks of brothers, uh, the, the Greek word, it can be male or female. Uh, 
meaning males and females, uh, but it can also be used in a neuter tense, which means everybody. Right? There was a back in the day in our English language when we addressed everybody, we said mankind, and we addressed the masculine form. Um, the NIV, updated NIV, tries to express that Paul is talking to everybody. He could have made that just male, or he could have just made it female, but, but he used a, a neuter version of the word to say everybody. Holy people... And then he goes on to describe them as faithful. You keep reading Colossians. You'll see in chapter 1, verse 7, 4, verse 7, and 4, verse 9, that he he pulls out specific people and he calls them faithful. We, We read earlier faithful Epaphras. You'll see a reference to faithful Tychicus, and you'll see reference to faithful Onesimus. Again, this is a, an aspect of uh, these New Testament letters when you walk through them slowly, aspects of them that I love. We know Paul, we know Timothy. Paphras, probably not. Tychicus, probably not. O- Onesimus, probably not. Not, but Paul addresses them. As long as the church is reading the Bible, they're preserved. The fact that these people that we don't know, we don't know their backstory, we don't know what they did, they're faithful. I think that's something for all of us. Not, Not all of us will be the one standing up in a with a microphone, right? When, when, when the church history is written, my name will get put into it because I pastored the church. I, I stood up with a microphone. But this church has existed for 161 years because there was countless faithful people that we don't, we, history will not know their names, maybe some, uh, but the vast majority, we, we won't remember their names, but the, the church survives on the backs of faithful people. To God's holy people in Colossae, the faithful brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And, and we'll end on this this evening. Grace and peace to you from God our Father, grace and peace. Uh, two big themes in the letters of Paul frequently uh, on his pen. I, I bet if you heard him preach in person, it frequently on his lips. Here you see it as a bit of a blessing to the church from the beginning. Grace and peace to you. Grace, this word appears 155 times in the New Testament. 155 times. This unmerited favor that God bestows his people. We don't deserve his love, but he gives it to us anyway. We, we don't deserve his forgiveness, but he gives it to us anyway. We, we can keep that list going. We don't deserve this, and we don't deserve this, and we don't deserve this, and we don't deserve this, but God gives it to us nonetheless. It's pictured in this word, grace. Giving a blessing to the church. May you live and breathe and walk and eat. Go about work. Go about daily tasks, realizing the grace that God has given you. Not only grace, but also peace. This is 
yet another word that our New Testament writers use and, and tilt the meaning a bit. Prior to our New Testament, that Greek word for, for peace just meant the absence of conflict. You know, may things just go your way. New Testament writers use this in the sense of contentment. Not so much the absent of conflict, but even in conflict. Peace. Right, we, we, we see this illustrated very uh, powerfully in, in Philippians chapter 4. Right? We, we may be stressed, fearful, and have all sorts of anxiety, and we can come to God and he takes all of that and gives us peace. You think about that? It's not that he takes all the problems away. <laughs> but it's in the midst of all those problems you now have peace. Anxiety goes away, not the problem. And you're given peace. The New Testament writers change the meaning of this word. Less absence of conflict and more this idea of contentment. He, he speaks this over the church. Grace and peace to you. But of course, Paul can't give that to them. Paul can't manufacture that on their behalf. Grace and peace to you. Not from Paul, but from God, our Father. Our Father. Think of these beautiful images that our New Testament gives us. God is our Father, a caring, loving Father that knows how to give good gifts to his children. That we can come to God seeking grace and peace. Now, those are good gifts. And he will give those to his children. When it comes to grace, that is my prayer that you sing with the hymn writer, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Grace to you from God our Father. When it comes to peace, I pray that you sing with the hymn writer, when peace, like a river, attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, whatever my lot thou hast taught me to say, it is well, it is well with my soul. Peace to you from God our Father. Let us conclude tonight in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray over this group gathered here in the chapel. And I pray for those um, tuned in at home, uh, watching on a TV screen or a computer or a phone. Uh, perhaps there, there are some listening by radio tonight or, or driving in a car. Uh, Father, anyone hearing my voice tonight, May they experience your grace and your peace. Father, I, I pray, maybe there's someone listening, watching, sitting in this room um, that has experienced a week void of grace and peace. May they sense, experience in a very real way your presence right now. Father, the book of Colossians speaks of the supremacy of Christ. 
May we live in that reality tonight. May we look at our life, our, our family, our problems, our, our struggles, our, our home, our, our workplace, whatever it is that weighs heavy upon us tonight. May we look at all those things and know that Christ is above them all. And Father, I, I pray that in the midst of our sin, our struggles, our failures, our, our addictions, our, our lust, our, our jealousy, um, our envy, our rage, whatever it may be, I mean, we see the truth of the cross and the empty tomb, that Jesus died for those sins and he rose from the dead to give us victory. I mean, we grab a hold of that now. Father, as we gather together tonight, beyond this Bible study, we pray for our church. In our church tonight, we know there are countless people that are headed home from the hospital. Some that are in rehab and in recovery. Tonight, there are many headed to the hospital. Um, Many uh, suffering tonight with all sorts of different pains and ailments and diseases. Uh, Father, we give those people to you. We intercede on their behalf. You, you tell us that we are to, as a church, pray for those who are sick. And Father, we lift those up, those to you tonight. Uh, Father, we know there are other needs within our church. Our, our church has experienced uh, many funerals in the last week or so. There are people mourning the loss of loved ones. May you provide them your presence, your peace, and your comfort. And there are many other needs, Father. May you meet them all according to your glorious riches in Christ Jesus. Father, we pray for our gatherings of our church. Wednesday night and all the small groups in between and Sunday mornings and Sunday evening services. Father, may, may you keep us safe. Uh, may you keep us healthy in your, with your mighty righteous hand protect our gatherings. May nothing keep your church from gathering as you've called us to gather. Father, we do pray for the end of this pandemic season. We cry out to you, the, the only one in control. Father, uh, we pray that this would come to an end. Uh, Father, I pray for this group tonight. May we go to bed tonight. May we rest our head upon the pillow, knowing that we are your holy people, that, that we are loved and provided for, cared for, not because we earned it or deserve it, but just because you're so good to us. Father, may we wake up in the morning eager to seek after you and do the things that you have called us to do. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, before.